first, uh, generally in the first few months of life. Um, so we can kind of look at them, see what we need to do and if there's any treatment and what happens in the future and how long does it take for that particular rash or lesion uh, to go away. Um, we're gonna talk about how to treat them. And then the most important thing is when to call your pediatrician. So in general, a lot of parents will notice the f after first few days or the first week of life, you'll notice the baby's skin is peeling a little bit. It almost looks like it's dry um, and you kind of get tempted to let me put some lotion on there. It's actually normal peeling. We expect that, especially in the bigger babies and the babies who were um, more full term or more, like who were there for about 40 weeks, 41 weeks. Um, it's basically, the reason behind it is basically, it's like swimming. When you swim, when you sit in the water for a very long time, your skin starts getting wrinkly and, and pruney. And so when you get out of the pool and you dry up, you'll start seeing that your skin is peeling. That's pretty much what it is. So you don't wanna sit there and peel it off because that's gonna actually cause more problems. What you need to do is just leave it alone when, uh, when you're giving the uh, baby sponge bath or baby bath, just gently exfoliate, you know, rubbing motion, just like the way you would wash your face to, to be gentle. Um, and over time, it will, it will fade. So the other one we usually see, um, especially in the first uh, few days of life, is called erythema toxicum, or ETOX is what a lot of people call it. Some people call it the newborn, uh, the newborn rash. And it looks, sometimes it can look really scary because you see these red st uh, streaks everywhere um, and they sh show up out of nowhere. And these ones actually migrate. Sometimes they fade and then they show up somewhere else. And then sometimes they'll come back to the same spot. They are not itchy. They are not an infection. They are basically, um, uh, just a skin um, skin rash. It's you'll see a lot of times a little pimple here and there inside the red streaks that looks kind of yellowish. It's just skin. The skin is uh, is is doing its thing. Um, there's nothing to worry about. Do not pop those uh, pimples if you see them. Um, whatever you do, it's going to go away on its own. It's very short term. It can last up to two weeks. Sometimes it can last up to a couple of months, but most of the time it goes away in the couple uh, in the first couple of weeks. Um, and if it does worsen and if it does look a little worrisome, um, call the office, uh, tell your pediatrician just to take a look. But I, there is, and I looked around, I, I've never heard of any um, long-term problems or in, inflammations or infections caused by erythema toxicum. Um, it's just a skin rash that we see very, very commonly. And now to the other rashes that you're gonna see are um, baby acne. There's other uh, rashes that look like pimply and um, sometimes they have redness. Sometimes they look like the skin scaly. The skin looks kind of yellowish. Um, sometimes it looks like buildup on the skin, almost like dandruff. So um, they're, in the end, all babies get some form of these rashes and they will, whatever we do, in the end, they all fade away on their own, in their own time. It's just managing the skin so it doesn't bother them. If, and also because you wanna have that beautiful skin, that baby look, um, you know. So let's see what we can do about it. So for baby acne, this is actually a picture of, uh, of baby acne. It's those little pimples. They're generally on the side, sideburns. Sometimes it's over the nose. Sometimes you see it on the chin. Sometimes you can even see it on the neck um, or upper chest. And it, they look like red pimple, uh, pimply, pimples, oh my goodness. Um, they are not actually the same as acne for a teenager or for an adult. It looks like it, but it's it's not exactly what that is. They, they are, um, their their skin, the skin is. Um, <laughs> I'm having issues today talking, um, but the skin needs uh, gets clogged. And a lot of it is also uh, the oily glands in the body. They're making oil, they're getting trapped in the pores, and that's what you see. And again, it's not painful, it's not, um, uh, it's not worrisome, it's just not pleasant to look at. But again, they tend to go away on their own, usually within the first week, uh, month of life. Uh, the main thing is gentle cleansing of the face um, and try to use gentle cleansers, not harsh soaps, avoid things that are super oily or lotions because um, those will actually clog up the pores even more um, and add on to that oily um, feeling. And um, 
letting the skin air dry a lot of times is, is helps a lot. Um, one last thing with most of these rashes, if you keep the bloom of the baby uh, a little bit on the cooler side, it helps because heat and humidity tends to make these rashes kind of uh, stand out a bit more. But again, the main thing is no picking at them. Do not scrub the skin harsh because that's just going to aggravate the skin and create more oily skin and create more of the acne. Um, if it gets to the point where it looks um, very extensive and very irritated, sometimes we do use, uh, we do prescribe um, antifungal cream to help with overgrowth of fungus and help it um, uh, decrease and go away. Um, if you see it that badly, I would call your pediatrician and just let them know um, to see if, if you're at that point where we need to, uh, to do that. It's not very common. Um, most of the time you get away with just cleansing and cleaning um, the skin. And next. Um, oh, actually, I do have to correct myself. It's um, it's an antifungal uh, shampoo, but sometimes we do use the creams as well and a steroid. So infantile eczema, it's eczema in general is basically dry skin. Um, it can uh, babies, baby acne and eczema and cradle cap, they all sometimes at some point can look alike. Um, but in the end, it has to do with the, with the distribution of where the rash is and the characteristics of it and when it shows up and how it responds to the treatment. So that's kind of how we can tell which was which. But sometimes, honestly, you can have one on top of the other. But again, in the end, babies are so resilient. They have brand new skin, brand new immune system, brand new everything. They, are, they will get over it. They will improve. Eczema is a little bit different in the sense that it's, um, it can be for several reasons. It can be from um, just you are prone to, to have sensitive skin and irritants will irritate you. It could be um, a bacteria, it could be a virus, but in, in general, you got to make sure that we take care of the skin. You want to avoid the scratching that happens with eczema. So with eczema, it tends to be... Um, uh, it tends to look dry, scaly. It's usually in patches all over the, the body, but in babies, um, it's in certain spots more than, more than others. And you'll see it basically on the cheeks, around the neck, anywhere where there's creases where heat and humidity can come together and kind of cause an irritation. So, and babies are, they have a lot of rolls. They barely have a neck because they have such beautiful um, big cheeks and they drool everywhere. So that, that's a setup. Um, and then they can also get it in uh, where the elbows are and behind the knees, sometimes at the extensors at the uh, ankles on the outside, you can see that too. So, um, the most common that you do see when it starts, show, starts showing up at first is usually around the cheeks and the neck. 30% um, of all babies that have severe eczema, those are the ones we want to look at because those might be related to some sort of food allergy, whether it's the protein in the, in the formula or, the, um, or some sort of food that they just started. But again, if, if, it's, if it's not bothering them, if we can control it and, and things are going well and it fades as we get older, nothing to do. If it's continuing and getting worse and you can't get the eczema under control and it's spreading everywhere and the baby's scratching all the time, that is, that's one reason to call your pediatrician, let them examine the baby, see if it's time to, uh, to, do, uh, to investigate if this is an allergy to some sort of food or material or even lotions or even shampoos or body washes. So it, it's not just one thing or that. Sometimes it's a little bit of, of uh, it's the combination of a little bit of everything at one time. Um, and so itching is one of the most important things to try to control when somebody has eczema. Because once you start the itch cycle, it doesn't stop. Once you scratch, the body automatically releases histamine. Histamine is the reason we scratch. So if you scratch on one end and you start releasing histamine and you have sensitive skin or you have some sort of irritation or an insect bite that has some venom in them that you're uh, irritated to, it's gonna start an H cycle and you're gonna start scratching everywhere. Heat does it too. If you take in a warm, or a, sorry, a hot, hot bath or you're sweating a lot because you're doing sports um, or the baby's playing, uh, um, or sleeping, uh, sorry, on, uh, for his nap, and he's sweating a lot, when you pick up the baby, they're gonna start scratching that area because the heat just activated your, the, uh, the body to produce some histamine and it makes you itch. Um, so trying to cool the baby down, um, 
cotton clothes, breathable clothes, try not to overwrap them, keep the, um, the environment dry and, and, um, and cool. And um, um, bathing daily is fine. Just make sure that you moisturize the baby because um, you want to keep that moisture in and you want to use thick ointment based lotions and avoid perfume products because perfume products tend to have esters and alcohols and alcohol esters that irritate um, and basically they dry off. That's how you smell. That's how they produce the smell. And when they dry off, they're going to leave behind dry skin and that's going to cause itching again. Um, so I'm not saying everything has to smell neutral, but <laughs> minimize it. When the baby's skin is back to normal, you go back to normal. Um, there is a, um, uh, if there is a history in the family of eczema, um, there is a chance that you might see it in the baby, but not all the time. Um, so if you notice that, it could be because, you know, it runs in the family. But nutrition, skincare, and growing up tends to make it get better or even disappear. Cradle cap can sometimes uh, mimic eczema or vice versa, and some people can mistake one for the other, but sometimes they coexist. But cradle cap tends to be on the face, the, the eyebrow, across the eyebrows and the forehead. Um, you see it on the, um, the sideburns, and it's called cradle cap because it actually follows, if you imagine somebody wearing a cap, it's literally, or a bonnet, it's literally where the name came from because they used to wear bonnets back in the day. And so the whole thing is covered, the sideburns are covered and down here and sometimes in the neck. So that's why, that's why we call it cradle cap because it looks like a cap and it's cradle, you're cradling a lot of um, that, uh, that um, dry, greasy, crusty, yellow um, uh, skin. Um, Again, this one will disappear on its own, will resolve on its own. The main thing is just gentle exfoliating. This one you do want to scrub compared to acne. You don't want to scrub the baby acne. You want to scrub the cradle cap. And the reason you're scrubbing and gentle scrubbing, you're basically exfoliating that dry skin and um, all of that um, uh, oil, uh, oil based um, um, buildup on the body you want to wipe it off. So gentle exfoliating, use gentle cleansers, um, and they, they usually have a, um, a scrubber made for the baby that's gentle. Sometimes it's a comb to kind of brush off that, those scales so they can reveal the nice, clear, healthy skin. Um, if there, uh, there is a couple things you can do. If you put a little bit of baby oil um, to soften the scales, sometimes that even helps when you're trying to um, remove those scales. Um, most babies, will, it'll go away by the time they're one year old. Most of them, though, it gets better a little sooner than that. Um, most of the babies that I see, and um, uh, if you do good skincare, you'll see it literally almost completely gone by six months, if it's that bad. In general, you'll see it back uh, on and off if you have mild, uh, mild version of it, um, but skincare. The one thing about cradle cap that I noticed people don't like is um, it gives the impression that you didn't wash your baby, that it's dirty. Um, and that's, that's the one thing I always try to remind parents. It's nothing you did. It has nothing to do with what products, what, what things you've done, that's the baby was going to have cradle cap whether we wanted to or not. We just have to maintain the skin. And next, teething rash. Those are my favorite. So when the baby's teething, these, they're constantly drooling. They're constantly have their hands in their mouth. They're constantly rubbing things against their face. Um, they're trying to get to that pain. They're trying to, they're trying to rub their gums. They're trying to eat things and they salivate everywhere. And that is going to cause a rash. And it's usually around the mouth and a little bit into the sides, uh, the uh, front portion of the cheeks. Sometimes you see it on the chin and a little bit lower. Um, it will go away, and I want to say magically, once they stop teething. Um, but if they're using a pacifier, it's going to last longer. So anything that's on, that's constantly rubbing against their face is going to irritate them because you've got the saliva there and it's, the saliva has, um, can be irritating to healthy skin. So one thing you can do is if you're starting to see a teething rash and it's not getting better, and, and you're using a pacifier, see if you can get rid of the pacifier. It's a, it's a good time to get rid of it anyway, so you don't have to worry about it later. <clears throat> um, instead of that, because when they're teething, they want to yank and, and tug and uh, um, gnaw on something. Cool teething rings, um, 
You can do the cold washcloths, because I know a lot of kids may like the teething rings, but sometimes they don't. So I find the cold washcloths are much, much better. So you get um, a small washcloth that, that you have at home that's clean, uh, uh, dunk it in some uh, drinking water, squeeze it, put it in plastic bags, freeze it, and then take them out of the freezer, take it out of the bag, the freezer bag, and then give it to the baby and let them sit there and tug on it. It will wash off the saliva on the face. It'll cool down the face from that, that red rash and they'll, they'll, it'll help them um, with the gnawing, with the, with the gum pain and the gum swelling. And then you just put it in the washing machine and get a new one. You don't have to sterilize anything. Um, if it gets really bad, because sometimes it, it, the skin breaks down so much and the baby starts scratching at it, um, there is a chance you can have a, a, a little bit of a bacterial um, infection, very superficial. Um, those sometimes we treat with, um, with uh, some an topical, an uh, topical antibiotics um, if needed. But if, you, if the way to keep it under control is you don't want to keep wiping the face with a washcloth because it's just going to scratch the skin and just and the baby's going to continue to make more mucus. So pat drying the face is better and then using a cotton washcloth that's a little bit wet with some cool water and just gently wipe away or pat dry um, uh, the, um, the saliva off the face. You can put some Vaseline daily to the really irritated areas. Um, hydrocortisone, sometimes we use it, but, in, uh, but it usually doesn't really help because it's the, the problem is the, the saliva. So either way, um, pat dry, keep it dry, uh, keep the area dry and clean, use washcloths, do not, uh, uh, soft cotton, wet washcloths, and, um, uh, uh, see if you can get the, uh, the pacifier out of the way. So milia is another thing you see on the face sometimes here and there. I think they're adorable when I see them. That's one of my favorite things to show parents. They, they literally look like they got drops of breast milk on their face. Um, they're, they look like pearls. They're tiny. They're usually scattered, not a lot in, in one place. Um, they're, they're white and they are bumpy, but they're not super hard. Do not squeeze them. You don't need to exfoliate them. You don't need to scrub them. I would leave them alone. Again, it's, it's, um, a lot of these are also in response to uh, the maternal hormones that they were swimming in. Um, moms make a lot of hormones, including androge androgens, which, um, uh, gives us the, the acne, they make us produce a lot of, um, um, uh, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's because of the maternal um, exposure of the, of the maternal hor hormones. So, and this is one of the reasons why they actually do go away on their own in the end, because you are shedding all of that. You are, everything that the baby has been swimming in, everything the baby was exposed to in utero, at some point will uh, clear out of the system. And so that's one of the reasons. Um, so for the milia, you actually wanna avoid lotions and you wanna avoid oily products, because again, this is buildup of androgens, buildup of oily skin, uh, oil, uh, oils under the skin causing those pearls, and it will go away. And it does look like milia, and that's why they call it milia, there. Um, this is another one that sort of looks like milia. Some people can um, confuse it with, uh, with cradle cap too. It's called sebaceous hyperplasia, which means the, the overproduction of oils in, on the skin. So, and it usually follows um, places on the face, mainly on the face, but places on the face that, are, uh, that have the oil glands that produce oil, it's sebaceous glands, um, and it's generally the nose and the chin. And they literally look like little bumps uh, clumped together on the nose, they're firm. Again, you do not want to squeeze them. You don't want to uh, break them open. You don't want to scrub them. Leave them alone. They will go away on their own, regardless of what you do. I think they're adorable, especially when they're on the nose. And then we get a lot of calls about heat rashes. Or it, they can look a little bit um, concerning when you see a baby that has a rash from head to toe like that. Um, heat rashes, again, they, they, they will get worse when there's uh, when, when you're over wrapping the baby, when the baby's uh, temperature goes up, when the room is too hot, or if you're giving them a, war a hot bath or a warm bath, it's again they will they um, they look like little pinpoint 
pink dots all over. There's generally no redness around them, but when they get upset and their temperature goes up, when they're crying sometimes, but when, they're, when it's hot and humid around them, you'll see them uh, pop out more. They'll be very visible and they look like the baby has measles. It's not, the baby doesn't have a fever, nothing. You just cool down the room, cool down the baby, um, and it will fade. It may not go away 100%, but it will fade to the point you barely, barely see it. If it's changing that fast, that's a heat rash. They're, they're not, some, some babies may scratch at it um, because it's more, when you have eczema or dry skin, when you're more susceptible to that, you're more susceptible to a lot of these rashes. So if they are scratching, just make sure that uh, if the area looks rough and dry around there, it, you wanna treat that area, you wanna moisturize that area. But in general, heat rashes don't, um, don't itch. Um, keeping the temperature down in the room, use cooler baths and light clothes and it'll go away. Of course, diaper rashes, those are very common. We'll see tons of different, uh, different ones, um, but most babies tends to be because of the irritation of the poop and the pee and the humidity of wearing a, uh, a diaper all the time. Sometimes you can get diaper rashes because of an allergy to something. For example, if mom is, um, if the baby is very sensitive to, um, um, to like spicy foods for some reason, when mom eats spicy food, the baby tends to get a rash, um, a diaper rash, because the baby, uh, the baby's, um, um, the, the baby's susceptible to that, and then you can get that rash. Um, it's not, a, um, that, uh, that one, usually we do a lot of elimination of mom's foods when we think there might be um, a connection between what mom eats and what the baby's responding to. Uh, so that's one thing to try is remove one thing at a time from mom's diet. Poor moms, they, we, we restrict everything. But in general, it shouldn't matter. If the baby's allergic to the diaper, for example, if they're allergic to, to, um, to the milk that they're drinking, to even breast milk, like the protein portion or, or other portions of the breast milk or the formula, the, um, and we're suspecting that, um, we may try things like changing formulas to a hypoallergenic formula, or um, we can, again, uh, try mom, uh, mom's uh, diet elimination uh, and watch. Um, it could be fungal. Those are the ones where you see it looks red and it's in the creases and it's got little pimples everywhere. That We call those satellite lesions. That tends to be more fungal diaper rash. Those will need um, an antifungal cream. But overall, any diaper rash, the best way to prevent it is to try to eliminate the irritants. Um, treat it if it's fungal or even bacterial. Sometimes you can get a bacterial uh, uh, cause. And it's generally from the strep and staph that normally live on our skin. Um, oh, uh, I have one more thing to say about that one. I, that, that picture is actually, I really like that picture because it shows you the degrees, how, how bad a rash can get. If it's mild, generally they uh, resolve on their own. Sometimes they can get worse and it depends on how, wh where the distribution is and how uh, how much of the diaper area is involved. If it's getting to the point that nothing is working, we need to see you so we can see, do we need an antifungal, do we need an antibacterial, do we need to do anything else? So how do you spot a rash? You, you look for any skin irritation, you look for chafing, um, and sometimes you'll see flaky skin, and of course the redness all over. Um, the causes, we just kind of talked about that. The friction is when, the, especially when the babies start moving around in those diapers and they're running around the house and they pee a little bit, they sweat a little bit. Um, all of them are treatable, manageable, and we can prevent them. So to prevent the diaper rash, you wanna stop it from even starting. That's the main important thing. There is nothing wrong with, cons with always using a diaper rash cream with every diaper change. Um, the, the ones that work really, really well are the ones that have zinc in them, the ones that have um, uh, any of those chemicals that, that act as a barrier, like uh, dimethicone and things like that. So A and D, um, butt paste, um, triple paste, uh, I think those are the most common ones. There's um, uh, Tubby Todd and the Bordeaux, the beeswax Bordeaux one, and I'm missing one more, Desitin, that's the more common one. Um, so the th four things we need to do to try to prevent a rash. Change the diaper, um, 
change the wet diaper as fast as possible. Um, and I think I misspelled something there. Change the wet diaper, not the wet red hand. I'm not sure what that word is. Um, clean the area thoroughly. Again, you don't want to scratch and irritate the area. You want to um, pat dry, uh, wipe pat dry. If you see a rash starting and you're using the disposable wipes, even though it says that it's, it doesn't have chemicals, in at some point they have to put some chemicals to preserve uh, these these um, products. So I would just gently um, wash wash the washcloth uh, under water just to get rid of any chemicals that are on there and then you can use it. Or you can use a, a dry washcloth with some warm water or those those uh, disposable um, dry wipes and just use um, mild soap and some water. Um, I would avoid perfume products and really, really um, heavily um, uh, per per perfume products and like uh, wet wipes that have scents in them as well. Um, when you dry the baby well, <clears throat> then you want to put the diaper cream on. Ointment works a little bit better than cream. However, the ones with zinc in them, zinc is, uh, tends to look white. So that's why the, um, the, the ones with zinc in them tend to be white and not ointment looking. Um, they both work really well. Uh, the last but not least, allowing the baby to air dry whenever possible to kind of get, avoid the irritation from moisture is would, works really, really well. You just have to time it to know that you're not going to take the diaper off and let the baby um, air dry when he's about to poop. <laughs> so, um, and then moving on to some birthmarks. So we see these a lot. I think they're adorable. They're called salmon patches. Some people call them angel kisses. Some people call them stork bites. They're basically little, they look like blotches behind the neck and on the face. Sometimes it's usually in the middle of the uh, forehead. Sometimes you'll see a little bit on the upper eyelids or even around the nose. Um, they look pale salmon colored but when the baby gets angry it it will um, become more prominent and it has to do with the fact that these are um, there there are blood vessels under there and when you get angry the blood supply increases and since you've got an aggregate aggregate of uh, vessels there blood vessels they're gonna fill up with more blood and it's gonna look more red so it's kind of nice you can tell when the baby's mad at you and when they have a fever you'll see the same thing they they tend to show up more the um the ones on the foreheads we call angel kisses because the angels supposedly came down and kissed the baby when he was born um and then the stork bites is because you know the the stork came and brought the baby to you. <laughs> um, they, uh, these will resolve over time. The ones that resolve faster are the ones on the forehead, the upper eyelids and the nose. The nape of the neck, that one on the back, the stork bite, sometimes it can last a lifetime, but a lot of times it will fade to almost nothing over, uh, over a while though, over, it might be a few months to, to a few years. It generally runs in the family. So if you see one on your baby, um, uh, check everybody else. So the next one is, uh, it used to be called Mongolian spots. Now it's called slate gray nevus or congenital melanocytic <laughs> lesions. Basically it's blue, blue birthmarks. Uh, they are grayish, dark blue. Um, they are most of the time most common on the back, the bottom back of the, um, of the, of the baby. Uh, closer to the bottom, but you can see it around the ankles. You can see it in different spots in the in the body. It's nice to kind of point those out to people because they can look like bruises and they used to be thought of as bruises as that person was not treating the baby well, but bruises change colors. Bruises fade and go away. They do not stay the same and not change at all. They do not, uh, um, uh, slate gray nevi, nevi do not change places do not change color, they stay the same, they fade over years. Uh, you can see them on the chest as well. Cafe Olays are basically the, the, the birthmarks that everybody, every now and then you see somebody with it, they're coffee looking, they look like coffee with milk. They're tan, light brown. They usually, you, you see them right at birth, if not a few, uh, a few weeks to months later. They're harmless, you, we don't do anything about them, but if you see tons of them that are small or big, large ones, we need to know and they look like cafe au lace. 
Um, strawberry hemangiomas I added, but um, I didn't want to get into too many of the of other things, but strawberry hemangiomas tend to show up after birth, sometimes few weeks to months after, and they start out as a red dot and they get bigger. Again, it's an aggregate of vessels that are either right underneath the skin or right above the skin, and they turn, tend to look redder. These resolve on their own. We don't do anything about them unless they are in a place that can, uh, like on the eyes, near the brain, near a liver, and we need to make sure we monitor those um, to make sure they're not growing and obstructing important things. Jaundice is just yellowing at the skin. Sometimes the eyes are yellow. Um, um, the main thing with jaundice is it's the breakdown of red cells and it, it releases bilirubin, which is yellow. It colors the skin yellow. Um, the more you eat, the more you drink, the more you pee and you poo, the more you're gonna get rid of those bili of that bilirubin. That's why our pee and poo are yellow and, uh, yellow and, and brown. So in babies, they lose weight when they're first born. So if they're having natural breakdown of the red cells and they don't have a lot of fluid in them, you're more likely to see jaundice. But we don't want that number to go too high. So if the baby's sleeping, poor feeding, uh, yellow skin, yellow eyes, we need to jump on that, feed the baby as much as possible, talk to your, um, to your pediatrician. And then I will, I'm gonna just finish up with the uh, sucking blister. Those are normal. These, those are actually, they are characteristic of showing that the baby actually sits there and sucks on their hands, fingers, or wrists when they're in, in utero. They're usually born with it. It looks like a blister, do not pop it. Sometimes you have it in the middle uh, um, of the upper lip in the middle. And that one usually is because they're sucking on the lip. If you see that later in, after a few weeks of feeding and the baby tends to suck on it too much, just double check, possible. Now I'm not saying all the time, possible uh, uh, tongue tie might, uh, it might be a signal that there might be a tongue tie. Um, but again, they don't do anything. They, they uh, dry up on their own. Do not pop them. That's the most important thing. And then um, I, I'm going to skip those, but roseola, I wanted to put it in there because a lot of parents see that. It's usually uh, three-year-olds and under. You get three or four days of really high fevers, no other symptoms, and then all of a sudden the, baby, the fever breaks on its own and the baby wakes up all happy and everybody's stressed out because he's got this rash that started on the belly and just went everywhere. Um, nothing to do once the rash shows up. They're not, um, they're not contagious anymore. And then of course the hand foot mouth disease, you see it everywhere. It can look like teething rash, but hand foot mouth disease, you should see the same sort of ulcers on the feet, the hands and on the palms and the soles of the feet. So, and of course, inside the mouth, you'll see ulcers, but, and that's about it. So hopefully that was a little bit helpful in, um, in showing some of the common things that we see in the worn areas and infants. Any questions? I hope you have. I hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully, you have some questions for me.